Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our special food and drink webinar or, or mini conference, which has been organized by our team of ambassadors from the CIM Food, Drink and Agriculture Group. My name's Mark Dodds, and I'm the chair of the group, and I'm supported by a hardworking team to help stage events such as these. We've got three great speakers today. Um, first one is Andrew Walker, who's Client Knowledge uh, Director at Kantar World Panel. We've then got Dr. Liliana Danila, the lead economist from the Food and Drink Federation. Um, and last but not least, we've got Simon Millard, who's Food Director at Fair Share UK. And they're going to be talking about some of the challenges and indeed the opportunities that the food and drink sector uh, faces today in these, uh, in these tricky times. But before we get to the presentations, um, I'll quick, quickly run through some of the more practical issues uh, about today's session. So our panel have put together some presentations and slides, uh, and each was going to present for around 30 minutes, something like that. After we've seen all the presentations, we'll move on to questions and answers, uh, where we'll open up the floor uh, for the panel to answer some of your questions. You'll be able to post questions uh, for, the que for the panel session at any time during the session uh, by clicking on the question mark you'll see on the screen. We've circled the mark on this slide for you, depending which device you're watching from. So if you're watching on a laptop, you'll find the question mark on the right-hand side of your screen, or along the top or the bottom if you're watching on a tablet or a smartphone. In terms of the video for the webinar, we're hoping to have this live on the CIM YouTube channel by the end of next week. And finally, of course, if you'd like to share your thoughts uh, on today's session on the socials, then you can use the hashtag CIM events, which you'll see on the screen. Uh, and we'd love to see your comments on, on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and we'll pop the hashtag up again uh, after the presentation's finished, um, just so you can continue to share your thoughts. So um, let's get things uh, started. Um, I mean, what a difference a year makes. Uh, this time last year, uh, inflation was sitting at about 4.9%. Uh, uh, and whilst there's some talk of uh, unrest in Ukraine, no one could have really forecast uh, the ongoing and, and the global impact those troubles and indeed others would have across the world, and in particular in reference to today, uh, to the food and drink sector. We we're already facing challenges such as labour shortages, increased energy costs and retailer pressure. Um, and the last 12 months have really shown that we can never be sure of what's around the corner. And also the ever increasing importance of, uh, of social responsibility for the sector because of the pressures that are being caused by cost of living crisis, etc. So we're lucky enough to have three brilliant speakers uh, who will give us their thoughts on the situation and hopefully provide us with some guidance for developing our future strategies for the next 12 months and beyond. Our first speaker is um, Andrew, Andrew Walker from Kantar. So Andrew has kindly delivered some of the webinars and indeed the live events that the group's hosted over the past few years. So it's an absolute pleasure to welcome him back again for today's session. Andrew spent two decades at Kantar helping FMCG businesses make sense of consumer behaviour. In his current role as Client Knowledge Director, his focus is on unpicking the big stories from Kantar's wealth of behavioural data and working with clients to design strategies that have changing customer needs at their heart. So Andrew, if I can invite you to turn on uh, your webcam um, and I'll pass things over to you. Uh, and the floor is yours when you're ready. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me just get through to the first of the slides. So um, I'm going to talk for somewhere around about 25, 30 minutes about kind of about inflation, but more more generally about what that means for shopper behaviour and following on from that, what that means for trying to go, grow a brand in this environment. And I've used the headline at the bottom to really emphasize my message, which is it changes some stuff. So inflation and rising prices change some of the things about how we grow categories, how we grow brands, but it doesn't change everything. And we're going to have a balanced view of what has changed and what hasn't changed. And because this is a topic that's so well covered, I spent a bit of time kind of thinking about how we could talk about it, make it engaging, talk about it differently to what you might have heard before. So I did my research on the sort of classic narrative art for a film or a piece of drama and, and essentially the, for those of you've seen this before it kind of has a beginning an exposition so where you've set the scene and lay out what's going on it then has what they call a climax where we see the sort of rising tension and the jeopardy increasing 
and then some form of resolution. So we can all recognise that from films we've watched, the plays we've watched, books we've read. And we're going to try and do that in the next 25 minutes in the realms of shopper behaviour and consumer behaviour, starting with the beginning, which is all about setting the scene and talking about the post-COVID landscape and understanding where we were before everyone started talking about inflation and the impact of price rises on the marketplace. Then our middle or our climax or the, the bit of most tension is understanding what growing financial pressure means for shoppers and how they're responding to it. And then we're going to finish with our resolution, which is my view or Kantar's view on how marketers should respond to everything that I've described. So without further ado, I'll start with the post-COVID landscape because and this might seem like a lot of looking back, but I think it's so important to understand where we are on the road back from all of the disruption we've seen over the last few years before we get into the impact of inflation because the two impacts have clashed and together they're creating a lot of the behavior but also a lot of the opportunities that are, that are resulting. So in terms of the post-COVID landscape I wanted to start very broad and just give you our view of how non-alcoholic food and drink is bought in the UK. So I want to paint a picture of five ways basically you can spend money on food and drink and hopefully you can imagine yourself in each of these scenarios. So the sort of blue, pink, bluey area on the left hand side, that is large grocery trips. So trips where I'm putting more than 20 items in my basket or trolley. That's 36% of our spend. Then we've got small grocery trips, which are trips where I'm purchasing fewer than 20 items. So those are kind of, that's the grocery universe, that's 29% of spend. And then on the right hand side, we've got what we call out of home. So we've got visits to cafes and restaurants, currently 18% of spend, takeaways, 11% of spend. So that's anything bought and consumed off premise. And then what we call retail on the go, which is products purchased from a retail setting that never make it out, never make it back into the homes. So that might be a lunch you're buying when you're out, a meal deal you're buying on the way, when you're traveling on the way to work, something like that. So there's your mix. That's what it looks like today. But what's interesting to us is how different is that? To where we were in 2019 before we'd even heard the word COVID. And here, here are the percentage changes, the extent of the shifts in share that we've seen versus where we are today versus where we were in 2019. And those might not look enormous. So you might say, okay, 5% increase in takeaways, 4% increase for large grocery trips. But when we take into account in the 12 weekending period that we're looking at, we're talking about a market that's worth 37 billion pounds. That even a 1% shift there is about 370 million. So it's a huge change. These, these shifts, they, they might not be massive in percentage changes. And also to emphasize, if we looked historically before COVID, these things would be very flat. So there's a real disruption in shopper behavior, how we're buying and where we're buying from that sets our context. And we can see the scale of that disruption when we look at the long-term view of specifically the take home grocery market, so products that are purchased and taken back into the home. So the left hand side shows a long term view of the value of that market in the last um, in the last 10 years or so. And we see in the latest year it's 130 million. And that's the level it's been at pretty consistently for the last three years. But that represents a huge increase on where we were in 2018, 2019. People are having to spend a lot more money on take home food and drink than they were previously. Initially, because they were spending more time in their home, so they were switching spend from out of home settings into grocery. But more recently, as we'll come on to talk about, because prices have risen very quickly. But it's interesting that despite all the disruption, the market value across the last three years has remained remarkably consistent, albeit for a variety of different reasons. And then the sort of the amount we're spending has changed and how we're spending it has changed as well. So at Cantar, in the way we talk about drivers of behavior, the, the key elements of shopper behavior, we would talk about the frequency, so how often you go shopping, which is represented by the sort of light blue color, the amount of items you're putting in the basket, so packs per trip, which is represented by the green color, the amount you're paying per item, which is the yellow, um, households, which is the change in population, and then the little dot represents the change in value sales. And I'll draw your attention to a couple of things on this chart. One is the relative lack of change between 2010 and 2019. Essentially, behavior stayed more or less the same. The only thing that was changing was that prices were fluctuating up and down to varying extents over that period. So you can only really see the yellow over that period. Then in 2020, we've got this enormous shock. People making far fewer trips, so we see frequency going down 
the packs per trip going up, people concentrating, wanting to be in stores less, so concentrating their purchasing into fewer visits to stores. But the important thing here is as we look forward through 2021 and 2022, those things haven't corrected, not entirely anyway. So we've seen packs per trip drop a little bit, but not to the extent that it grew in 2020, so still higher than it was. And we've seen frequency rise a little bit, but nowhere near to the extent it dropped in 2020. So we're behaving differently. We're buying different amounts. And even and this is in the grocery world. Even when we go out of home, the mix in the way that we're purchasing the spending is very different. So again, to characterise our purchasing out in the out of home arena, if we very simply make a dichotomy between trips where I'm purchasing and spending less than £10 and more than £10, if we look at those trips where I'm spending more than £10, so what you might call those more special trips, those, those more planned trips typically, the value of those is recovered to where it was in 2019. If we look at those more incidental trips on the left-hand side, those where I'm spending less than £10, that might be a coffee when I'm out and about, or as I said earlier, a meal deal, those are only at 60% of where they were in 2019, so 40% lower. So because of our lifestyle shift, because of the shock to our habits, we're behaving radically differently to how we were in 2019, be that in a grocery setting or be that in an out-of-home setting, still today, more than a year on from any kind of restrictions on the way we live our lives. And th I think that's really important context for what we look at next, because that's we've, we've, we're already in an environment where shopper habits are, are being disrupted, they're in churn, and then we're hit by the next shock, which is growing financial pressure, which we're all aware of. So this next section isn't going to be me talking about where inflation comes from. It's, it's all about how the shoppers is responding, how we see shoppers responding, and what that means for how brands and categories should respond to that. So here's our long term view of inflation in the grocery market. I'm sure you'll see examples of inflation in the other presentations as well. But this is the this is specifically in take home groceries, really just to emphasize that we're in a situation we've not seen for the last 30 years. You see inflation in our latest 12 week numbers at 14 percent, even in that 2008, 2009 period, it only just about touched double digits. So we're in a situation that many shoppers won't remember. And indeed, many people in the industry won't remember. And that is having a tangible impact on how shoppers feel about spending their money. So one of the things we've done with our sample over the last couple of years is, is gone to them and said, which of these five boxes would you put yourself in? And you see the groups along the top. So you, you basically tick one of the five boxes. So I don't have enough money to cover my expenses on the extreme left. I don't even have to think about, I don't have to restrict my spending in any way on the extreme right. And what we do use that to create a segmentation that we call struggling, managing or comfortable. So if you tick the bottom two boxes to say, I don't have enough to cover expenses or I'm just about making ends meet, you're in the struggling group. If you tick, tick the other the two boxes at the other extreme, you're called comfortable. And if you're in somewhere in the middle and you say, I'm just about managing, you stay in the managing group in the middle. Now, the thing I want to draw your attention to is the extent of the change over time, because when you run these general sort of attitudinal studies, you tend to see these things don't change very much. People respond in very similar ways year in, year out. What we've seen is the struggling group double in size between May 2020 and October 2022 from 14% to 27%. So shoppers have a fundamentally different mindset when they walk into stores than they did two years ago. But I think the danger with that and the danger of some of the data I've just shown you is that because inflation is the dominant narrative, what we tend to do then is try and explain everything through the prism of cost of living. So everything that's happening, that brand's growing because of cost of living, that retailer's growing because of cost of living. People are behaving in this way between cost because of cost of living. So here's an example. So shoppers are putting le less items in their basket. Oh, that's because of inflation. Um, everyone's flocking to the discounters. That's because of inflation. Different categories are topping the growth charts. Oh, that's just because of inflation, putting, pushing prices up and pushing people's behaviour in, in certain directions. But actually, when you look under the skin of it, there's lots of other things still going on that are driving the trends that we're seeing. And, and this is so important when we think about strategy and how we respond. Because actually, when we think about shoppers putting less in the baskets, a lot of that is still about post-COVID correction, as I showed you in the first section. When we look at people's flocking to the discounters, yes, some of it is about people seeking value, but it's also about simply there are more Aldi's and Lidl's out there in the country, which give people more, more people access to the stores and give people more opportunities to visit. And yes, different categories are topping the growth charts, and some of them 
because their prices are rising very quickly. But a lot of them, as we'll show you towards the end of the session, are about still about creating volume demand. And this is so important because this says to us, if we still on the left hand side need to understand what the fundamental market trends are. It's not all about inflation. Um, we still need to make ourselves physically available to people because that is still a fundamental thing that will make a massive difference to performance. And on the right hand side, most importantly, we still need to create volume demand, however good our price, price pack architecture is and our promotional strategy is, we still need to give people a reason to purchase our products. And another reason why we can't focus entirely on inflation is because shoppers aren't fundamentally changing all of their behavior. They're changing their behavior at their margins. So a really useful stat to remember from, from all of this is that all, our long-term work says that shoppers in grocery typically absorb 75% of inflation. So if inflation's at 10%, they increase spend by 7.5%. If inflation's at 20%, they increase spend by 15%. That isn't the behavior of people ripping up their shopping list and starting all over again. That's the behavior of people looking for little savings at the margins. And we'll come on to the significance of that in a second. And then the other theory and the other thing we've seen historically is that the choices that shoppers make tend to be to seek the path of least resistance. If I'm forced to save money, I'll make the choices that are least disruptive to my life. So on the right hand side here, we start with the thing. If, if you think about your grocery shopping, you kind of got four options in terms of the way you save money. Um, you can buy the same product, but find it on promotion. You can choose a cheaper product, so you could buy a private label product instead of a brand, for example. You could choose a cheaper store. You could shop in an Aldi or a Lidl instead of a Tesco or an Astor or Sainsbury's. Or you could physically buy less stuff. Now, wait, the way that we see it is from, moving from the right to the left, you're becoming more disruptive to your choice. So the easiest thing to do is I'll just buy the same thing, but I'll find it on promotion. I'm getting the same, I'm fulfilling the same need, but I'm saving money. And then steadily, as I move to the left-hand side, I'm being more disruptive to my life. And this isn't just a theory, because when we look back to 2008, 2009, and the way in which people save money when inflation sort of hit about 8, 9, 10%, we see the primary way that people save money is by buying more in promotion and by choosing cheaper products, by trading down, by buying cheaper, not by buying less. So we've got two theories from historical data. One, that people will absorb about 75% of inflation, the other is they'll kind of take the path of least resistance and buy cheaper before buying less. So the question then is, is that actually true in 2022 in the same way it was in 2008, 2009? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, so to set the scene for two, two headline numbers with a comparison back versus 2019. So we take out all of the impact and all of the noise around COVID that we saw in the first section. So if we take cumulative inflation versus 2019. Um, we, see, we have inflation up at 19%. So that's a bit higher than the number I talked about earlier because you've got three years compounded on top of one another. If we look at how much more shoppers are spending on groceries versus that time they're spending about 12% more. So it's not quite absorbing 75%, but it's in that kind of region, absorbing the majority of the inflation. And then we can say, okay, there's, but there's a seven point gap. How are people saving that seven point gap? Because if they were just buying exactly the same things, they'd also be spending 19% more because they'd just be absorbing that inflation. And if we look at how they're doing it, that 7% gap is made up predominantly of choosing cheaper, either by buying cheaper product, by trading down to cheaper products or buying more on promotion. And a smaller proportion of it is about buying less stuff. So our two theories about how people behave are borne out. They're that the first thing I'll try and do is find ways to buy cheaper. If I'm forced to, I might buy less, but it's not, that's not a primary response in the majority of grocery categories. And at this point, you might say, OK, this is really generic. So you're talking about categories in general, but grocery covers a massive spectrum of things and categories that are expensive, categories that are cheaper, categories that have seen very high inflation, categories that have seen very low inflation. So let's just explore that a bit further and think about how this varies at a category level. So um, slightly complex chart at, at, at this point, but these, these orange dots represent all of the 286 categories that we split grocery into. And what you're looking at is the relationship between inflation and the likelihood of shoppers trading up or down. So inflation along the bottom, so further to the right, prices rising more quickly in those categories, 
um, and then up the side, trading up and trading down. So the higher up the chart, people trading up year on year, lower down the chart, people trading down. And the reason for plotting this is to test the idea that, OK, if I'm in a category where inflation is very high, presumably people are much more likely to trade down and I'm at much more risk of people trading out of my brand into private label. Whereas if I'm in a category where inflation is less than 10 percent, maybe four or five percent, then I'm protected from that. And my shoppers are much less likely to go elsewhere. And what this proves is that that theory is, is not true in any sense. There's very little relationship between these two things. And, and you think that's quite odd because we've got categories where inflation is 30, 35 percent. We've got categories where inflation is less than 5 percent. Why are people not responding differently? Um, and the reason is that shoppers aren't aware of which categories in the main, which categories are going up in price and which aren't, because very few items in grocery and known value items. The way it works from a shopper perspective is I can see the overall price of my basket going up. That used to cost me £20. It's now costing me £25. I'm not quite sure where those price increases are coming from. And therefore, I'm going to make my choices based on which categories and which products I place the most value in and those I'll hold on to. And which of the 25% or so I'm willing to sacrifice and trade down. It's not driven by which are going up most quickly in price. It's about my judgment and my level of choice on where I want to trade down and where I think I'm sacrificing the least by trading down. So to build on that, just three ideas on where what drives the difference. If it's not about inflation, if it's not about inflation that drives shopper choice, what what are the things that make categories more or less exposed to shoppers choosing to seek savings? The first is the nature of the shopper. So we think back to our struggling manager, managing comfortable groups that I talked about at the beginning. They're, they differ massively in importance depending on the category you're in. So to look at two examples on the left, we've got tonic water and bottle colas. Tonic water gets 17 percent of its sales from, from um, struggling shoppers. Bottle cola is 34%, so twice as high. So in theory, bottle cola is much more exposed to people looking for savings because more people who see their budgets under pressure. In the middle, we've got the level of options. So some categories, there's loads of scope for me to trade up and down. So skincare being an example where I could spend anything from a couple of pounds to a couple of hundred pounds on a skin cream, whereas milk, prices are much more concentrated around the single, um, a, a few key items that are that are sold in that category. So the figures you see on the chart here are the percentage of sales that are within 20% of the category average. That's very low for skincare and very high for milk, which says skincare is much more prone to people trading down because there's the opportunity to do it. And finally, the bit that we're going to tackle in the last section is priorities. And this is where the sort of marketing stardust comes in. So how clearly are you articulating to people the value of your product, the value of your product that the shopper should place in it and why they should look elsewhere for their savings and not choose it in your category on your brand. And that is the question we're going to answer in the final section, which is amongst all this pressure, amongst everything we've observed about shopper behaviour, how should marketers respond? And we're going to recommend three things to think about. The first one, and I'll explain each of these as we move on. The first one is about mind the gap, what we call mind the gap. The second one is change the optics. And the third one, where possible, is to reframe your value. And I'm going to whiz through each of these with a couple of examples. And the first two, we're going to use the example of paper categories. So I've called it a tale of two papers. On the left-hand side, we've got kitchen towels, so represented here by plenty, where we're seeing private label growing share very quickly. And then the right-hand side, we've got toilet roll, represented here by Andrex, where we've got brands holding share. And we're interested here in, OK, if we're seeing such different behaviour in the same environment in two very apparently similar categories, what are the characteristics, what are the behaviours of those brands, of those products that are causing people to trade down in one but not in the other? And, and very simply, we can see some of the story just by looking at the price and the, and the key SKUs that are selling in Tesco in, over the period we're analysing. So here we've got the top five SKUs in Tesco. We're comparing the private label products, which is the one on the left and the two on the right, with the brands, which are the two plenty products. These are the biggest selling five SKUs in the category. And, and at the bottom there, we've got the year on year change in price. So we see that the branded products are up about 30 percent in price. The private label products about 10 percent. So two observations. And this is where I talked about mind the gap. We're seeing the price gap widening. 
which is making shoppers or, or encouraging shoppers a little bit more to think, hang on, is it worth paying the premium for the brand? And the second, really importantly, is the direct comparability between the brand and the private label. The packaging is quite similar, the colouring is quite similar, and we've got a two pack and a four pack in each of the two ranges. So shoppers can directly sit there and go, okay, how does that price compare? How much am I saving? Very easily, how much am I saving by going from brand to private label? Then if we look at our other example, which was toilet roll, where we're seeing brands hold share, we see quite a different story. The first is we're not seeing any massive differential in changing price year on year, so both increasing at somewhere around about 15%, so that gap I'm talking about minding isn't getting any bigger. But also, the optics have changed. So I talked about changing the optics and, the, and changing the comparability. So what's happened here, and this isn't driven by the brands at all, but I think it's a really interesting example, that Tesco have moved their large 24-roll private label pack into exactly the same pack, but it's 12 double-sized rolls. So they're advertising it at the same volume. It's a sustainability move but it looks different for the shopper. It confuses the issue because they see a 12 pack versus a 24 pack, and suddenly the value equation isn't quite as simple as it was in our toilet, in our, in our kitchen towel example. So you see how changing the optics and removing that direct comparability can make a massive difference to shoppers prone to trade down because they're having to do different cal cal calculations and they're not making like for like comparisons between the brand and the private label in quite the same way as they might have done otherwise. And then finally, what's happened here is something else which has disrupted the comparison, which is the entry of a lower tier brand that sits somewhere between the mainstream brands and the private label, which again, disrupting the choice for shoppers and making it not quite as simple for them to make the judgment, which is simply brand private label, say 40% or don't say 40%. So that's Mind the Gap, as you can see on the left-hand side, um, change the optics, as you can see in the middle. And then the last one is reframe Oh, no, sorry, I'm, I'm, miss, I'm skipping ahead and forgetting one slide. So I, I, we're talking about the importance here of, of direct comparability and breaking the extent to which shoppers can make the direct comparability between you and a cheaper alternative. And another piece of evidence for the importance of that is if we look at um, which size of brand has lost share as private label has gained share over the last year, we expected to see that it was smaller brands that would lose because they'd get squeezed out as um, private label gets more space on the shelf and smaller brands would be prioritised. Actually, the story is exactly the opposite and the biggest drops in share are amongst the biggest brands. And the hypothesis here is because private label typically tries to compete directly and mimic the characteristics of the biggest brand in the category, the biggest brand is suffering disproportionately as private label grows. Whereas those smaller brands, which often have a different positioning and a different reason to exist on the shelf, are actually holding out much better against the rise of private labels. So re-emphasizing that idea of changing the optics and removing that direct comparability as I talked. And now we'll move on to the final point, which is this idea of reframing value. And this might look like an odds example, but I think it's a really good one. But if you can't do the two things I've talked about, if you can't keep the price gap between yourself and cheaper competitors down, and if you can't easily change the optics and the comparability between you and private label, can you change the value equation entirely and get shoppers to think differently about the value of your product? This is an example of a cycling helmet advert, which is saying, yes, I'm an expensive, we're an expensive cycling helmet brand. We're more expensive than other things on the shelf. But is that the right comparison? Because actually, if you spend willing to spend $100 on your kids' trainers, why wouldn't you also pay a premium to protect their head as well? So it's changing the point of comparison, saying you shouldn't be comparing me to the other product, cheaper products on our shelf. You should be comparing me to totally different things that you spend your money on and reframing that value entirely. Now, this might seem a long way from food and drink that we're talking about today, but is it really that far away? If you think about a ready meal product, for instance, it might be more expensive than its competitors in the fridge and in the chiller when you walk into a retailer. But if the comparison becomes getting a takeaway or going out to a restaurant, suddenly the value, the value equation looks very different for that product versus a cheaper alternative that someone might have on the shelf. And suddenly I'm thinking about what I'm getting back for buying the product and not the money I'm having to invest or lose to buy it. So those three ideas, um, and then just to finish up and just to kind of bring them to life, we wanted to just look at, let, let's use some case studies. I'm not going to go into any depth on these at all, 
but look at the top 10, the fastest growing brands in grocery in the last year and just see if we can learn anything from them and see if we can see them sort of using any of those ideas that I've just talked about. So these are the top 10 fastest growing brands in grocery on in terms of value percentage growth for the 52 weeks of 2022 versus 2021. Um, the numbers of the percentage in value change. And you look at them, you think there's not much of a pattern. There's not much, um, there's not much that they have in common, um, except for the fact they've all grown by somewhere between 18 and 13 percent. The other thing to take, take into account, though, is not all of them have grown because they've dropped driven volume demand. Some have just seen prices go up very quickly. So I just wanted to highlight those with these little arrows. So the green are those that have also seen volume go up. The reds are those that have seen volume go down. But have also managed to but really managed to grow through inflation, essentially, or price premiumization. So we're really more interested in those that have created volume demand and driven value on top, which are the five with the green lines and for those of you who joined this the similar presentation last year you've heard me talk about this before but what we at Cantar talk about the four kind of growth drivers the things that always make the difference between those brands that, that are hitting the top of these growth charts and, and those that aren't and that's what I wanted to finish on and those four growth drivers are getting more presence so being more visible more available to shoppers essentially getting into more categories, and that might be categories or subcategories that I'll come on to talk about. Getting into different consumption moments or fulfilling new and different needs for consumers. And always, always, when we look at these charts and we look at the brands that are at the top of the charts, they're fulfilling one or more of these examples. So to, to, just to build up to finish the presentation, um, we've got, we had Fox's Biscuits at number one. What they've done is a lot more promotional activity. They've really connected into the loyalty schemes that are very prominent in our major grocers today and have taken advantage of that to give them more presence and more visibility to the shopper. Charlie Biggums, which is a brand that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be doing well in a time when more shoppers are struggling for um, financially. And it's a very premium ready meals brand, but one that's performed extremely well over the last few years. A lot of that is about more presence and, and that kind of virtual circle of initially doing very well in weight trays and now expanding its distribution. A lot of the growth over the last year has come in Sainsbury's expanded as it's expanded its presence there. In terms of more categories, now I think people often interpret this as you have to go fundamentally dip to a fundamentally different category. I have to take my drinks brand into confectionery or I have to take my snacks brand into ready meals. That's not usually what we mean here. We mean different partitions within a category, understanding the way that shoppers navigate your category, and finding the different partitions to operate in. So LucasAid is a nice example of this. You typically associate LucasAid with a bottled product, which is a different sector of, this, of the energy drinks market. Over the last year, they've gone more directly into that growing sort of large can format, which has a different type of shopper, a different part of the shelf, and creates incremental sales as a result. Um, more moments. Fanta is a good example here. So Fanta have created more moments by creating a bit of intrigue around the product with the mystery flavor, which is represented by the pink bottle at the bottom, but also getting into more moments with a different format. So more growth through these large format 24 can packs. So you, again, you might normally associate Fanta with um, big two liter bottles that where the consumption moment would typically be, I'll buy it and we'll consume it over the weekend and it'll be a treat. Suddenly, if you get people to buy in this format, it becomes more of an everyday drink and those consumption moments grow and it feels lunchtime occasions and so on. So getting into different moments isn't always about marketing. Sometimes it's about packaging. And more needs, as an example, we're looking at Kleenex. So Kleenex have, have had a very strong connection with the charity Mind, talking about mental health and associating their product with mental health. So getting products for people to see the product differently, differently versus comp competitors and seeing it fulfilling a different need and associating it with a different need than they might have done otherwise. So always, always, regardless of the situation, regardless of the financial situation, regardless of what shoppers are telling us about the budgets, if your marketing strategy doesn't fulfill at least what isn't pulling at least one of these levers for next year, you're unlikely to deliver the growth that you're looking for. So just to sum up, we've, we've been through our three sections, our beginning, our middle and end. I think it's really important that we don't forget that lockdown and the, the the response to lockdown is still creating disruption in our lives. People are still finding ways to re, um, readjust. So don't forget about the opportunities created by that. 
in terms of the impact of inflation, it's important to react, but don't overreact because shoppers aren't overreacting. They're changing their behavior at the margins. They're making choices at the margins. Actually, the key strategy is convincing shoppers that yours isn't the product that they should seek to save on. And finally, how you do that, think about value framing. Think about those three tools that I talked about. But ultimately, the principles of brand growth are the same. As we said right at the beginning, you still need to create volume demand. And you'll still do that by thinking about those four growth drivers that I showed on the last slide. Um, and that was it from me. Thank you very much for listening. And I'll hand back over to Mark. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Andrew. As always, uh, you know, a massive, uh, fascinating insight uh, from Kantar. Uh, not surprisingly, it's, um, it's, it's delivering quite a few questions. Um, quick reminder, you know, do put your questions in the question section and we'll pick those up at the end of the presentations. Um, so we've looked through Kantar at sort of the consumer, at the end user uh, side of the uh, of the food chain. Uh, we're now going to look a little bit more at the producers, and um, we're delighted to be joined uh, by Liliana Danila from the Food and Drink Federation to sort of cover this. Liliana is the lead economist for the Food and Drink Federation, where she provides in-depth analysis for the Federation's more than 1,000 members across the UK. The information and insight she provides helps food and drink businesses to develop their strategies in light of economic and other pressures. And prior to joining the FDF, she worked at the British Retail Consortium, so she has an excellent knowledge of both retail and producer aspects of the food and drink sector. So without any further ado, Liliana, your webcam's on. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to dive right in and I'm going to set the scene by presenting this slide which shows a little known fact about our industry which is that food and drink manufacturing is actually the largest manufacturing sector in the UK, is larger than automotive and aviation combined. So what you, uh, what you can see here is what is the share of manufacturing output by manufacturing sectors. And you can see that food and drink produces 16% of the manufacturing um, output, the highest in, uh, in UK. And we are also the largest employer in, uh, in manufacturing. So I'm saying this on the one hand to underline that the economic contribution of the sector is, um, is very important for uh, for the UK and on the other hand the the sector is extremely important by the nature of of its product of its production right so it produces food high quality food very diverse food which brings a lot of joy in uh, into our homes though of course if uh, if we are um, thinking of what has happened with, uh, with food prices uh, recently, maybe that joy is, uh, is slightly diminished. So what you, uh, what you may see here is what has happened with annual inflation in food and drinks, specifically in food and non-alcoholic drinks, so this excludes alcoholic drinks, and what has happened with the average UK inflation. Um, the food inflation is represented here in the in the light blue uh, line, and you may see few uh, few things. One that for several months now, food inflation has outpaced UK average inflation. Uh, second, in December, uh, food inflation has reached 16.9 percent, so almost 17 percent which is the highest level in the last 45 years. Uh, this stands in, uh, in quite a sharp contrast to whatever was happening even just in December 2020 when food prices in the UK were in deflationary territory. Um, and also, while it's believed that UK inflation might, uh, might have peaked, that's not the same about food inflation, but that's a point that I'll get back to um, towards the end of my presentation. Um, not only that food inflation is the highest in 45 years, um, but it's also quite well spread. 
The OMS, which is the Office for National Statistics, reports on 49 main food categories. And in December, 43 out of those 49 had seen inflation in double digits. Even more, some, uh, some considerable number, uh, numbers of categories are actually now in the 20s, 30s. And um, as you can see here, low-fat milk is the category that has displayed the highest, uh, the highest rise in prices at an eye-watering 46% year on year. So what I would like to, to do today is to try to explain a little bit why do we see some such uh, such rises in uh, in food prices to to see where where the industry is and to uh, to give our opinion as to what will happen with future food prices and for how long uh, for how long rises will continue when uh, when will inflation come uh, come down and when will prices come down so let me start with um with how uh, how did we uh, how did we get here? Well, in a nutshell, there have been three structural shocks to uh, to the industry. One was Brexit, the second was the pandemic, and third was the war in Ukraine. So, if I uh, if we think a little bit, what has happened in broad lines during the pandemic is that originally there was this very big shock to uh, to the global economic order, if you wish which meant that a lot of panic was felt both by households and by producers, any kind of producers all over the world, which resulted in many production facilities being either partially or fully shut down. And as, we, uh, as I'm sure uh, you're aware of different, um, different uh, uh, shipping containers left in different parts of the world. Um, as the governments were trying to wrap their uh, their heads around the situation. In the high income economies, strong fiscal and monetary uh, support packages were um, were uh, were passed, which have supported, on the one hand, the the demand side. So consumer households started uh, um, feeling more comfortable about uh, spending, and it also supported the production side. The problem was that demand global demand aggregate demand had risen significantly at the same time all over the world which has put a lot of pressure on um on commodity markets right there was a much higher uh, demand for that on raw materials and on resources in general on the other hand the um the very sudden rise in demand aside or against the, the backdrop of some, um, some um, stoppages in, uh, in production at the beginning of the pandemic have meant that now there was very difficult for the production side to actually match the, the demand side, for supply to match, uh, match demand. On top of that, also lockdowns had, um, had changed uh, labor uh, migration patterns, which also, added to, uh, to the pressures on the production side. So that, that was one, one big shock to the economy, which we are still, uh, still feeling today. Uh, then we had the invasion of Ukraine, which for our industry had, uh, had multiple impacts. On the one hand, with Russia and Ukraine being the main suppliers of wheat and different, uh, different other cereals in the market, that had put a lot of pressure on the on the global um, global cereal market. Um, then, with Russia, one of the main energy suppliers to Europe, gas prices had had shut uh, shut up. Uh, the industries, the food and drink manufacturers, are usually high. Um, high users of energy, so quite uh, the production of food is quite energy intensive, which meant that they would be quite uh, impacted by the, the rise in, uh, in energy prices. And then also fertilizer prices were uh, badly impacted since fertilizer is a byproduct of, uh, of the gas production. So if gas prices 
the gas production becomes more expensive, fertilizers become more expensive too. Um, so we had another major disruption in the market when uh, when we still hadn't uh, hadn't quite finished with the uh, with the impact of uh, of the pandemic, and all of this was happening against the back, uh, backdrop of Brexit, which uh, meant that the um, the trade of uh, the terms of trade with the EU had been uh, had been severely impacted, and there was uh, there is much more uh, red tape. There is still not clarity in regards with uh, uh, certain rules, so that that poses quite uh, quite a lot of headaches. So to uh, to illustrate the the complete unprecedented and spiraling production cost, I'm going to take you through few slides to actually illustrate what uh, what has happened in terms of impact on production cost and the magnitude of cost rises that's seen by uh, by producers uh, here you uh, you have a graph of, of the gas price in uh, in the UK um, and you uh, you may see that gas prices started rising in mid 2021 which is important to note uh, and then it follows quite a lot of volatility, but they are much more elevated. So it's important to note that gas prices have uh, risen since June 2021, because it's actually then when Russia had uh, had started cutting their sales of gas on the spot market. So they are still fulfilling their contractual obligations, but they were not delivering as much on the spot markets, which were the markets where countries the markets countries would use to uh, to fill their uh, their reserves so it's then when uh, when gas prices started rising over the last year on average energy um, energy prices have risen uh, fivefold which is an absolutely unprecedented um, event and it's also very difficult to uh, to manage because it was to a large extent, unexpected. Uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the year, um, prices had uh, had come down significantly. That's because we uh, we and in Europe too, there had been a prolonged uh, fall, and also the the winter. It doesn't really quite feel like today, but the winter has been relatively mild. So prices have have come down, which is a positive uh, piece of news. What's less positive is that now they are about three times higher where they, uh, I mean, compared to their level in 2020. So the direction of movement is is great, but we still have a long time until uh, until we reach levels seen before the pandemic. And also, there's quite a lot of uncertainty as to whether prices will continue to drop at this rate in the following months. And the impact of that on the industry has been quite difficult to uh, to put in words. Uh, what you uh, what you may see on the left hand side here is a response from uh, from our members uh, to a survey that we ran in the beginning of October, uh, where we had asked what was the share of their operating costs. Uh, what was um, the share of operating cost of energy in Q3 2021 and then in Q3 2022. And on average, uh, the responses were that energy represented 12% of operating costs in Q3 2021, but a year later, that share had increased to 22%. So a 10 percentage point increase in just energy as a percent of operating costs, which is difficult to um, to really comprehend and to understand how how one manufacturer would deal with such a such a rise and then on the on the right hand side you have the uh, the answers broken down by uh, by different uh, um, different shares of uh, of rises in cost So energy prices had uh, had skyrocketed 
global food prices had also been continuously run, uh, persistently uh, increasing since mid-2020 until March of this year. The lines here show what has happened with global food prices in each year from 2019. And you, uh, you can see clearly that in mid-2020, they started rising. 28, uh, the line of 2021 prices is significantly above the level of 2019 and 2020. And then they continue to rise until March 2022, uh, after which they, uh, they come down and they finish the year pretty much at the same level where they were in December 2021. Uh, so what has happened in the, in the global uh, food market is that, again, once, once the, the support from government was given in many, in many countries, we have seen an uh, a rise in, um, in demand for different agricultural products. Also, we have seen China that, was, that started building up their, uh, their reserves. So China had started buying more, um, more food on the global market, both in terms of um, food and animal, uh, I mean, cereals for uh, um, use for, um, for food production and for animal feeds. And also there were some um, some negative uh, weather um, impact all had pushed up global uh, global food prices so while now they uh, they are coming down they have come down a little bit because um, the the Black Sea initiative had to some extent calmed markets a little bit nevertheless over the entire of 2022, compared to 2019, global food prices were 51% higher. And if you look at what has happened to oils, so to vegetable oils, they were more than doubled and 126% higher. Uh, then there were quite significant disruptions in, uh, in global supply chains. Here, the Global Supply Chain Pressure Index, which is put together by researchers at the New York Fed, um, a, uh, a value of zero shows basically no, uh, no pressure, everything works as expected and everything is smooth. But what, you, um, what we can see in 2020, 2021 and 2022 is that those pressures were very elevated, which were manifesting themselves in uh, very high freight uh, rates at one point about uh, five uh, over five times higher than uh, than pre-pandemic levels now those pressures have come down but they are still still there so again a move in the right direction but not things haven't quite uh, quite settled yet um also the sterling had depreciated about 10 percent over the last year that uh, that is excluding the period of, uh, of the trust government. Um, and this is important because most, uh, most, com uh, most agricultural commodities are traded in dollars on the, on the global market. And about 45% of our food is imported. So this impacts our, um, our members, the, the food and drink manufacturers significantly because they, uh, they have to pay more for, uh, for whatever they import just because the the sterlings has weakened relative to the dollar without anything else without anything on the on the real side of production as we say having uh, having changed and in the same uh, in the same survey we have uh, so the one that was run in october of last year uh, we had as businesses how um, how worried and how impacted they were by uh, by the depreciation and you may see that about 50 percent of them 57 precisely have said that they were either impacted a lot or a great deal by uh, by the depreciation um, also the tight labor market have meant that wages were pushed up the the competition for talent and to uh, to attract talent to to keep talent in uh, in house means that wages must have uh, must have increased 
And what you see here is what has happened to wages in our industry, split by food and drink, and then what had happened to wages in the UK. This is ONS data, which is, uh, which is collected and is asking the question, is collected on, um, uh, in the beginning, in the first half of 2022, but is asking the question, what were your wages in April 2022? So this is a picture of not necessarily 22, 2022, but rather April 2022. And this distinction is important in this case where we have had such a rapid change in inflation and in wages over the year. So basically in April 2022, wages in the UK had uh, risen by about 4%. While in, uh, in the food manufacturing, those uh, wage increases had surpassed the UK uh, rises, and in drink manufacturing, depending on whether we look at the mean or the median, were either in line with, um, sorry, if we look at the mean, they were higher than, uh, than the UK average. If we look at the median, they were broadly in line, slightly, uh, slightly below. So there's a lot of pressure from, uh, uh, from uh, the labor market. And finally, there was um, there is a lot of pressure on um, on the um, on the farming output. This is um, this is data put together by um, uh, by Defra and um, and the body looking at the um, agricultural and uh, horticultural markets. And what you see is how uh, how the agricultural uh, um, outputs have changed in terms of prices, which is the dashed line, and how prices of what goes into, into getting those outputs have changed. And it's very clear that there's a long while until um, those cost rises, especially of fertilizers, but also of energy and animal feed, would, uh, would trickle through into, uh, into agricultural outputs. Though we already see uh, see some of those, right? Most uh, most of the very high increases are in uh, in dairy, and they have to do with the fact that fertilizer prices were pushed up, animal feed prices were uh, were pushed up, and then also the the drought we had over the summer meant that some of the farmers had to feed their winter feed to um, to their uh, had to had to feed their winter feed uh, during the summer because there was um, there was such a drought, and animals could not uh, could not just graze as uh, as normal. So what uh, what this was was a very long list of all the cost pressures that manufacturers are feeling, and I haven't even gone over everything. Transportation costs play the role. Packaging costs are uh, are also uh, adding a lot of pressure. But in sum, absolutely every cost component is seeing major pressures and those kind of pressures depending on the good or the the market we're looking at they have started since mid 20 and then continued um uh, up to uh, up to now with some signs that those pressures are are easing on average our members have told us that their rises over the year to q3 2022 which is between Q4 2021 and Q3 2022, on average, the, their production costs have risen by 21%. But also, some of those uh, some of those costs might not have cost cost rises might not have yet um, been realized because some of our um, members are actually purchasing. Um, their uh, their ingredients using fixed term contracts or forwarded contracts so some of those impacts might uh, might hit them later too but nevertheless this is still uh, way below than where food inflation was at the end of um, at the end of q3 in the uk so having seen this this barrage of um, of cost rises and again the the major disruptions in the market especially during the pandemic, the question is, where, where is the industry now? And uh, here, 
We have the net confidence tracker, which is also uh, something that we get from, uh, from our survey, where we asked our members how do they perceive business conditions to have been in the past quarter relative to the previous quarter. So in Q3, majority of, um, of our respondents have said that conditions in Q3 have uh, substantially deteriorated compared to Q2. And what is striking here is that the, the food manufacturers are much more pessimistic now than they were even at the height of the pandemic. And it's very clear that this mood started, um, started turning uh, more pessimistic in Q3 2021. So when, excuse me, when gas prices and energy uh, prices started, uh, started rising. In addition to, um, uh, to all these cost, uh, cost pressures, the other very big pressure on the industry is, uh, is labor force, or rather the shortages that the industry is experiencing in, uh, in their labor force. Um, and while we know that the pandemic has meant that some people have, um, well, maybe all of us, we have reconsidered our priorities in life, but some people have, uh, um, have had the, the ability or maybe the luxury to retire earlier. So some people have left the labor market earlier than it would have been, um, uh, I know, predicted, should I say. Um, also that the UK is dealing with many people that, uh, that are suffering from long-term illnesses, which prevents them from, uh, from joining the labor market. So there is quite a high pressure on, um, on the labor market right now in the UK, even, even now as the economy um, shows sign of, signs of slowing. But it seems that our industry was disproportionately impacted by um, by these labor market shortages. And what, uh, what you may see here is what was the vacancy rate, which is basically the number of vacancies per each 100 employees in, uh, in the UK, shown by the blue line, in, uh, in manufacturing, overall manufacturing in the UK, shown by the red line, and then uh, what was happening in our industry, which are um, data from the survey. And we can see that the, the vacancies in our industries were uh, surpassing both UK and manufacturing uh, vacancies. And not only that, number of vacancies were much higher, but labor shortages were reported across a wide range of roles and skills. So our members report that they are missing uh, high-skilled workers, such as engineers or scientists or uh, sales uh, um, staff, but also they are missing technical staff like food technologists or uh, uh, packaging technologists. And they are also missing production uh, uh, or warehouse operators. So uh, uh, workers in, um, in the first line of production. So given, given this overwhelming uh, context, we have, uh, we have asked them how, uh, how are they managing cost increases? And 60% um, of them, okay, the, the numbers here don't add up because they could have chosen more, uh, more um, options. So let me say that to, uh, to be able to make uh, sense of this slide. 60% uh, of them said that uh, making production more energy efficient was, was one way or changing their procurement strategies. So trying to, basically right to cut uh, cut costs by becoming more energy efficient trying to adapt to um, to find maybe um, different uh, different suppliers again to try to avoid some of the costs but what was very worrisome is that 49 percent of them have said that they would either pause or cancel uh, investment projects which is worrisome because long-term investment will be, or investment is a driver of growth. Um, other, uh, other strategies adopted was reducing marketing expenses or trying to look into uh, restructuring or uh, reducing uh, workforce or reducing uh, training and marketing budgets. Um, a slightly different questions, but um, 
uh, coming to uh, in a way to the same answer, we then ask our uh, our members what factors are likely to limit their capital um, investment and 73 percent of them said uh, cost pressures which means as we know and again is in line with um, the other uh, the other um, uh, question i just mentioned that these uh, these cost pressures these cost increases have been of such um, such a, an unprecedented but also unexpected nature that it was difficult to plan for them, but also that they had to shoulder some of the increases in order to be able to stay in business. And in some cases, it meant that they had to sacrifice um, investment projects, which is quite worrisome. And then the other, um, uh, the other um, way to... Uh, um, or the other big uncertainty that uh, that our members have when it comes to to capital investment is uncertainty about demand, and maybe this um, uh, this has to do a little bit with whatever uh, Andrew had presented earlier, where indeed there's uncertainty about demand, not knowing how much people will uh, will continue to buy in light of uh, of uh, high inflation that they are experiencing, but also how will they change their uh, their consumption are they going to shift behaviors in just shifting to uh, to a cheaper supermarket or are they going to also shift their consumption basket and probably the answer is uh, is a combination and one uh, one picture to show how um, how badly things are uh, are felt through the industry is to look at what has happened to, to insolvencies in the industry. Um, and we have here insolvencies in 2022, uh, only up to October including, because that's the most uh, recent data. And we can see that in food manufacturing, if we compare those insolvencies in 2022, so over the first 10, 10 months um, over the year, compared to the entire year of 2019, Food manufacturing had already seen more insolvencies. It's 145%, uh, so 45% more. Drink manufacturing had already doubled. And you can see that that's much higher than whatever happened in Great Britain or manufacturing overall in Great Britain. So this points to the fact that the industry is starting to, uh, to feel quite, I know, the ultimate. Um, price if you wish where we see a lot of fatalities given the the tough environment and it's um given we uh, in our industry the the profit margins are relatively low it's a bit difficult to deal with such ongoing persistent cost pressures so the question is what's going to happen next and we think that food price uh, inflation is going to continue Till, uh, till about mid-summer 2023. Uh, that's because there is a big lag of between seven to 12 months between rises in production costs and rises in prices on the shelf, so rises in retail prices. And here we have different indicators of input costs or production costs. And um, the yellow orange line is retail, um, are the retail prices. And you can see that retail prices started rising only mid 2021 compared to the other costs that started rising in 2020. And again, the, not only there's a delay, but also the pace is, is quite different. So while for for households, we think prices will continue to rise. The question is, what, um, what will that mean for, uh, for businesses? Well, businesses are trying to become more energy uh, efficient, and that is their top priority. But also, if they are undertaking investment, they are also trying to maintain their competitiveness and to become more competitive by developing new products or new manufacturing processes, which will attract um, new uh, new customers but also will um, will enable them to deal with uh, with different manufacturers uh, with different uh, sorry with different uh, 
um, regulatory uh, requirements. So developing new manufacturing processes may refer, for instance, to reformulating your products to uh, to have um, to have them more uh, or containing less salt or less uh, less sugar. Also. Um, on the on the bigger picture, our uh, our members are very keen for uh, for tax in incentives from uh, for capital investment from uh, from the government and improvements to uh, to the EU trade deal. They have um, they have listed this as their top two um, um, initiatives that they would like to see from uh, from the government. So in uh, in sum, our our industry has been faced with uh, with three major shocks over the last uh, over the last five years. Uh, to some extent, resilience has has uh, has been eroded. Cost pressures are still very high, but they seem at least some of them seem to uh, to be easing. Nevertheless, while easing. Uh, no costs are still where they used to be compared to three years ago, and there are there are huge pressures from the labor market, which means that this is competing for internal resources when it comes to to investment. And some of our members have have said that they have put investment on hold or they have cancelled all altogether some uh, some of their projects. Um, in other words, the big um, the big um, direction or the big uh, uh, thing that we see right now in um, for our members is that there is a lot of uncertainty going on into uh, into this year. And with this, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, to pass uh, back to uh, to Mark. Brilliant. Well, thank you, uh, thank you once again, uh, Liliana, for some, uh, I suppose, worrying, worrying statistics for the uh, uh, for everybody reading uh, and uh, attending the webinar today. Um, I think it just just show how um, food manufacturing is is impacted, and also, you know, the pipeline going forward in terms of investment and innovation, which is so key to the sector, um, and how the brakes are being put on that. So, um, so yeah, so concerning times for the uh, producers. Um, thank you very much again. Um, our next uh, speaker, um, I suppose uh, we invited uh, Simon, Simon Millard from Fairshare, um, to come and join us, really to um, just to bring a focus to, to the pressures that, that consumers are facing. Um, Andrew mentioned the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the group of people that were, uh, found that they were struggling um, has doubled in size uh, in recent times. And so, you know, we're seeing a real sort of social change, um, um, which, you know, the sector can challenge. Um, and there are innovative ways to do this. And, and you know, every, everybody everybody here, um, you know, can, can play a part. Um, so let's say our final speaker is Simon, uh, Simon Millard from Fairshare. Uh, Simon's the food director, uh, where he leads a team responsible for developing relationships with the UK food industry. Um, to help secure and distribute surplus food to over 10,000 charities across the UK. Prior to joining Fair Share, Simon uh, has worked in the UK food industry for 25 years, so he's got a good background in, in what goes on, what happens, uh, both in major manufacturers uh, such as Mars and Premier Foods. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Simon, uh, who's going to tell you about, uh, about Fair Share. Thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you, Mark, and good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, to be talking to you all uh, this afternoon. I'm going to try to touch on and summarise some of the food challenges uh, that affect us uh, both environmentally and also in our society. And I'll try to explain and bring to life what we are trying to do about that. Um, you may or may not have heard of Fair Share. We're actually the UK's largest food redistribution uh, charity. And um, we essentially move food from A to B, A being where it's surplus, and B being where it's needed. Uh, I'll touch on this more shortly, but to put that in context, uh, last year we moved about 55,000 tonnes of food um, to over a million people via about 9,500 charities that we sent that food to. 
and they provided about 130 million meals, which works out at about four meals per second. Um, but yes, I will uh, attempt to bring that to life for you. And I'll also talk about the partnerships that we build um, with UK food organizations to help us do what we do. So to start, it off, to start this off, why do we do what we do? Um, it may um, surprise and hopefully shock you to know that over half of the world's habitable land is used just for producing the food that we eat for human food. Um, now that of course impacts the environment in many ways, but one of the ways it impacts us in particular is around carbon emissions. Over a third of all human-made climate emissions uh, come from the production of food. Now what makes that um, even more shocking is that a third of all food produced is wasted. So a third of, of human caused total carbon emissions are caused by food production. A third of that food ends up getting wasted. So you can do some simple maths to realize that a ninth of all human made climate emissions are caused by food waste. In fact, if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest country in the world after the US and China. And you would need land the size of China to produce all of the food that gets wasted. Now that's on a global scale. And the stats are kind of equally stark when you look through the lens of just the UK. 3.3 million tons of food are wasted in the UK annually. And that's before it reaches us lot. By us lot, I mean us as consumers, before it reaches the household. Um, a lot of food, of course, is wasted at a household level in our consumption of food. But before it even reaches us, 3.3 um, million tons of food is wasted annually. Most of that is at the um, early production stages, uh, farming level in particular. Um, but to put in context the, the size of our impact at Fair Share, we distribute about 55,000 tons um, of food a year. The size of the opportunity, though, is significant. There's 3.3 million tons out there that are potentially um, accessible as food waste that we could move to those that need it. Now, if I move on, um, I guess the second key um, driver for why we do what we do is around UK food insecurity. We have this rather crazy situation where we have full bins i.e. the stats that are shared on the previous slide. We have full bins but empty stomachs and it seems insane that we have it that way around. Um, there are now 13.7 million people in the UK who are classed as being food insecure or who are suffering food insecurity. Insecurity of food is defined by those who are making difficult decisions to um, to not be able to access food when hungry. So for example, skipping meals entirely whilst hungry, um, feeding children but not feeding the adults in their household, um, difficult decisions where they don't have the money to access food. Now 13.7 million people is the stat that was updated in September recently. I've had to change that statistic uh, frequently when, when presenting uh, presentations similar to this. Back in 2020, the stat was 4 million people. Um, then throughout last year, that went from 6 million up to 9 million, up to 10 million, and then 13.7. So there is a growing and a fast growing level of food insecurity in the UK. And given that we are such a, a, a large and rich global economy, it, it strikes me as fairly shocking that one in five people now is food insecure. Those with households with children, one in four families. And in fact, there's now 800,000 um, children who do not qualify for free school meals, many of whom are going hungry. I heard a, um, yeah, a stark message um, from one of the schools that we support recently that children are going to school with empty lunch boxes because they come from families that are not eligible for free school meals. So they're not able to receive food at school through that mechanism. And the reason they're taking an empty lunchbox to school is because they don't want to appear poor in front of their friends, um, which is a shocking state of affairs for, for those children to not, not be fed. In fact, we hear feedback from teachers saying that on a typical day, 10 to 15 children would knock on their office door and ask 
for ask for food. So it's not surprising then that we have so many food banks. Uh, there are two and a half thousand food banks now in the UK. That's more than there are branches of McDonald's. Um, and in fair share, we, um, I guess, obviously we're on the sharp end of this challenge. Uh, but we're seeing a change to some of our food types that we're distributing. Um, potatoes, for example, have become less popular because of that eat or heat dynamic that you may have heard about, where people are having, make, having to make tough decisions between eating um, and heating, particularly this week where it's pretty chilly out there. Um, but potatoes take a lot of energy to cook, and people are now taking less or fewer potatoes from us as a result of that eat or heat uh, dynamic. So that's why we do what we do. So Fair Share is there to turn an environmental problem of, um, of actual and the potential for food waste, and we turn it into a social solution. That, in a nutshell, is what we do. It's, um, it's fairly simple, really. We take the food that may become food waste, and we use it to feed people. Um, last year, we distributed, like I say, 53,000 tonnes. Uh, we helped 9,500 the frontline charities who use the food in the work that they do, and that delivered nearly 130 million meals, um, saving a lot of, um, of carbon emissions at the same time. As I said, we're the, the UK's largest food redistribution um, charity, and uh, yeah, we're trying to get that balance between um, solving an environmental problem and turning it into a solution, a social solution. Um, our vision is that no good food should go to waste, and our mission is to maximise the social value of that surplus food. Now, what do I mean by maximise social value? Um, it means that we want to support communities and charities who tackle hunger and its causes. And the and its causes is, is what I mean by tackling um, food and adding social value. Um, the answer to food poverty is not more food. Um, it's more money. So the answer to food poverty is economic. We need the right economic platform in place, the right jobs. Um, the vision uh, or the requirement is that people have got the money required to buy food from, from normal shops. Um, but food banks exist to give out food parcels. The challenge with, um, with the food banking model is that it solves hunger for maybe five or six hours up to a couple of days. What we're trying to do in Fair Share is to support those food banks, but we're trying to maximise the social value of surplus food to remove people from food poverty by, by helping them come out of the food poverty they're in. But this journey starts with the organisations that support us. Um, you may work for one of these organisations, and if you do, I'm incredibly grateful for, for, part, for your partnership with Fair Share. But we work with over 600 manufacturers, um, taking food, accessing food at, at a factory level, um, but also farmers, growers, packers, producers, also retailers and wholesalers, uh, retail uh, predominantly from retail distribution centres, but also at a store level. So we work with many of our retail partners, um, Tesco, Sainsbury's, as the Morrisons, just examples, uh, where we work with those organisations. But we are also kindly um, able to access food at a store level and move food from a store level through to the charities that we support. But those partnerships are not just kind of one one dimensional transactional discussions about, please, can we have your surplus food? Um, there's more to that. We try to build depth and breadth to those to those engagements. A couple of examples would be uh, Premier Foods, where uh, you can see that campaign there, win a dinner to give a dinner. Um, they made it available through an on pack activity to um, to win a ten pound Tesco voucher, and, and by so doing, Tesco gave. Uh, sorry, uh, Premier Foods gave £10 direct to Fair Share, so it helps us to fund the cost of our operation. Uh, Tesco, in fact, do something similar. Um, there was a campaign recently called Buy One to Help a Child, which was around um, uh, giving a, a donation of a small amount of money for each sale of fruit or vegetable through Tesco's stores uh, last year. Just two examples of, of how we work with organisations. But to bring to life what we do, we have 31 warehouses throughout the UK where we receive surplus food from the food industry. We then uh, very gratefully have the support of about 5,000 volunteers who help 
um, cut that food down from the pallet loads or the lorry loads in which we receive it down into manageable um, selections of food that we then deliver to the frontline charities. So we sort it, pack it, distribute it through then small vans out to the frontline charities that we support. They then turn that food into nutritious meals and food parcels, which they give to the vulnerable people that they support. Uh, and through doing so, we're able to reach, uh, like I say, about 130 million meals per year to about a million people per year. In terms of the types of food we, we receive, of course, we receive surplus food because that's food that has the potential to become waste once it's um, reached the end of its possibility of having commercial value for that organization. It is still absolutely fit for consumption. It's not um, always short shelf life. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not just the kind of the wonky veg. This is great quality, high value food items that we receive, but for a number of reasons, it has become surplus. So that's by far the majority of the food that we receive. We also kindly receive donated food. So you may yourselves have seen, uh, if you go into a store like a Tesco, there might be a, a collection point after the tills. You can buy a um, bag of pasta, place it in one of those collection points, and we would receive that food. We have similar conversations with manufacturers where we're saying, you may not have surplus, but we absolutely need you to donate food to us as well because of the social need that exists in the UK. And from time to time, we would also buy food. The government gave us money to buy food during the pandemic. It's not part of our mission or purpose, but if the government would like to give us money to buy food and we can then distribute that food to where it's needed, we can absolutely do that on behalf of the government. Another example of how we uh, use money to access food is through a scheme that we run called Surplus with Purpose. Um, a good example of this would be at the farm level. So a farmer who has a contract with a supermarket to supply a certain quantity of produce at a certain price, if they harvest or if they produce more than that contract is worth, they may not have other contracts available to sell that, sell that food to, to sell that over production to. In those scenarios, it is cheaper for the farmer to plough those vegetables back into their field than to harvest them at risk of not being able to sell them. So what we do is we make available a pot of money which will offset the costs of harvesting so that we can then access that food ourselves and give it to the people that need it. But that surplus with purpose um, scheme is something which, um, which we pay money for, which we fundraise against, which we're asking government to support us with um, to access food which may otherwise go to be wasted, um, particularly at a farm and production level. And that reminds uh, me of that earlier stat around 3.3 million tonnes of food waste. 2.9 of that is at that primary production and farming level. Now, in terms of the organisations we support, or the, with those 9,500 organisations we send food to, it's one of many of these. These are just many examples of that type of organisation. So schools, reference clubs, youth clubs, care homes, community cafes, um, social supermarkets, family centres, food banks, hostels. It's all of those things. And we are supporting their users. They may be suffering with homelessness, mental health, um, maybe elderly, may have loneliness and isolation. It may be about substance dependence, death advice, job support, domestic abuse. There's many different reasons why those individuals need help and food is part of the package that helps get them that help. Uh, one example would be a drug um, dependency service um, I met recently based down in Brighton. Now they give out free lunches. Um, people who have substance dependency are often feeding their habit rather than feeding themselves so they're hungry now if we can bring them in and give them a meal it allows that charity while they're there being fed to talk to them to give them support put them in touch with local support agencies that can help them kick um, kick their substance dependency so whilst they're being fed they're receiving that support as well as um, kindness um, and help uh, and companionship at the same time. And that's one example of um, what we talk about when we talk about unlocking food's superpowers. We want to provide a hand up, not a hand out. So it's far, we, we, we try to work with organizations that are doing far more than just simply giving out food. 
we're trying to help people um, break that cycle of food poverty in the, in the first place. Uh, and the logic of this comes when you think about what food actually is for us, what it does for us. It's not just about dealing with our hunger and feeding us. Um, food connects us. It creates connections. And when you think back through your own lives, if you think about the pivotal, uh, pivotal moments in your lives when you're celebrating something, a first date you might have gone on, a wedding, a birthday party, when you're seeing friends, when you're socializing, food is what creates that social setting. It's what binds us. Um, it creates those connections. It allows people to talk, to celebrate, to support, uh, to show love and kindness to each other. And it's that basis then that helps all of those other support mechanisms be provided. Now, the, the charities that we send food to, if they can get food either free or significantly cheaper by accessing it through us, it means they can invest money in their core services to deal with all of those challenges that I shared. A couple of examples. Um, I've been to some homelessness services recently, one in central Cardiff and one in Manchester. Uh, the place in Cardiff um, had a kitchen where you can go in, uh, you can sit, receive support, receive advice, receive assistance whilst having a nutritious meal, whilst talking to other people in a safe environment. So it's good for those users of that service. It's also good for the people cooking the meals because the people cooking the meals are gaining skills. Um, and this is an example of how we invest in employability. We're giving people opportunities to learn skills such as catering, cooking, those kitchen skills, which once learned will enable somebody to then go on and get a job working in a restaurant or a bar somewhere to hopefully then break them out of that cycle of, of poverty and homelessness that they're suffering. So it gives them that opportunity to get a hand up. Um, in, um, in Manchester, there's a homeless service I went to, which which has a cafe. Now, not a cafe for, for the homeless people themselves. I mean, a cafe for, for you and I, we might walk down the street, uh, want to nip in, buy a coffee. It's essentially just like a Starbucks or a, or a Costa coffee, buy a cake, get a coffee. And the people working in that cafe are the users of that homelessness service. They're gaining those kind of barista skills that would help them to gain employment somewhere else. So they're, they're gaining those qualifications. And it's a good example of how we try to add value, um, how we use food's superpowers uh, by investing in these employability schemes. So whether it's gaining skills working in kitchens, um, in cafes, or whether it's gaining skills working in one of our 31 warehouses where people can get forklift truck licenses, um, uh, warehouse admin skills, it gives them a chance to then move back into employment and break their own cycle of of dependency on things like food banks and food parcels. The food hygiene courses, cooking, working cafes, just one of those examples. But why else do we like to build these good relationships with our food partners? Um, well, it's partly so that we can help them do the right thing. If they have surplus food, we can help them connect that food to the people that need to eat it. But there is also a cost of, um, of dealing with food waste and we can reduce that cost for those organizations. But really, it's about staff engagement. We know that the staff of the organizations we work with, they feel good that they are helping us. We feel we know that they feel good by doing things like volunteering days when they come and work in one of our warehouses, they're packaging food parcels or they're going out in vans, delivering it, talking to the very people that are working for those frontline organizations or, or receiving the food themselves. It, uh, having done this several times myself, it feels fantastic to, to know that what you're doing is giving back to society. Other benefits, of course, things like those unpacked promotions that I mentioned earlier on with organizations like Premier Foods. But what we're looking at here, those six to 700 organizations, those food businesses in the UK is giving them a package which is not just about food, but it's also about uh, fundraising, staff engagement, employability, um, PR, and um, and helping them look good because we can shout loudly and proudly about the support they've given us. So I'll uh, I'll close there uh, just with this final comment um, from my boss, our CEO, Lindsay Boswell, when he says, we don't believe that the surplus food is the solution to food insecurity or poverty. It's up to the politicians to find those solutions. But as long as surplus food exists, we want to get the maximum social benefits from it. Um, 
So with that, I'll thank you for your time and, um, and for listening to this talk today, and I'll pass you back to Mark. Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for a very, um, well, it started off a very sort of uh, stark presentation, I think, with some quite harrowing figures, you know, truthful, but, but harrowing position, but certainly, um, and I'd say uplifting towards the end because there is so much benefit. And I think today when brands are, you know, they're being judged on, on what they do as well as what they sell and the need to engage employees with short, uh, tight labor markets. Um, you know, what a great opportunity for, for the people listening in um, to get involved in um, in a great, uh, in, in some great projects. Um, so thanks very much to, to all of our speakers. Um, we're now going to sort of head into the uh, into the questions and answers section in the next um, in the next few minutes. So uh, do keep if you're listening, do keep asking questions using the questions box. We've still got time to uh, time to complete them. Um, so uh, just a little reminder also that if you want to tag us in on social media, uh, please do using the hashtag CIM events. Um, so, speakers, if I can ask you sort of to pop your, your webcams on, and we'll, we'll dive into some of the questions. Um, I mean, I'll start with a quick question uh, for each of you to get the ball rolling, if that's all right. Um, and we'll start with Andrew. I mean, Andrew, a great presentation on sort of consumer insight and, and, and what marketing teams can, uh, can do about, uh, about the current situation. And, and you highlighted the four um, brand growth levers towards the end of the talk, which is, you know, do one of these or do as many of these as you can. Um, which one do you think uh, marketers should focus on if they if they can only focus on or which is the most important? Quick one. I think I think um, the one that correlates most with performance is presence, so being available in as many places as possible. But I'm conscious as I say that you can only achieve that if there's demand there. And retailers don't just list products because they they um, they think they should. They do it because they think they know they're going to sell. So I think the creating presence drive driving some of the others and i'd say the one that makes the most difference is need so challenging the idea that if we're doing something new if we're creating something new if we're adjusting the product are we demonstrating to shoppers that they can fulfill more needs by using the product i think that's the one that, that makes the biggest fundamental difference mm, thank you i think i think it obviously also depends on you know the resources of the business as to which they can tackle doesn't it and in terms of their um you know their development activity um Ileana, I mean, great picture from uh, about the immense pressures that producers are facing at the moment, that are facing over the last 12 months and, and, and things to come. Um, as if that wasn't enough, um, you know, it, it's on the headlines all the time now. We're, we're getting, uh, you know, a lot of demands for uh, salary increases to match the increase in inflation. Um, and I suppose there is a danger that that's going to trigger a, a spiral of uh, wage and, and price inflation, which will... Um, I think the Bank of England have got a 2% target. Um, so the chances are that um, we're not going to be there for some time. Um, I mean, what implications do you think that's going to have for the sector? All right. Yes, indeed. The Bank of England has a target for inflation of 2%. Um, and yes, the most recent data show that the nominal wages, so before we adjust for inflation in the UK, have gone up by uh, over 6% which is the highest on record, um, which is on the one hand has, uh, has the potential to, to keep feeding in, uh, in prices since with low productivity, firms will have to, uh, uh, to pass it on as an increasing cost. Uh, but putting together also the, the tightness in, uh, in labor market, uh, in labor markets, what we have seen is that firms are trying to to automate more so we might be at some point not necessarily in that far uh, that far future where we'll see that uh, a lot of the production processes would have been automated so basically replacing labor with capital in econ speak yes so essentially essentially trying to solve two problems by you know investing in in automation and and just reducing the the uh, the, the the labor labor crisis um simon um again you know great presentation but a simple question you know if, if anyone in the audience want, wants to wants to support fair share or, or get involved um you know what, what should they do about it 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Mark. And yeah, I, I would love to receive support from from anybody in this session today. The um, what it what it is we need is food. So you may work for a food organisation, um, and if you aren't partnered with an organisation such as ours at the moment, and would like to work with us to um, help benefit from the surplus food that you may have, um, we'd love to talk to you. If you're not a food organisation, then you still have resources that we would value. Money, obviously, um, we are a charity and we fundraise to uh, to cover the costs of our operation, which is essentially the um, the movement of all of that food around the country and the delivery of all of that food. Um, but it's not just money, it may also be time. So if you're able to give up some time and volunteer, um, we have 5,000 volunteers working in those 31 regional centres and, and warehouses, whether it's receiving food, um, packing it into our vans or driving and delivering it to the organizations that receive it. Uh, we would love to have some volunteering support. Um, or you may be involved um, with your organizations taking decisions such as Charity of the Year. And if you are looking for ideas for who could be your next Charity of the Year, I'd love for us to be on that shortly. Excellent. Lots of ways to get involved. That's what I like, I like to see. Um, Okay, moving on to some of some of the questions that um, that, that have been uh, uh, contributed by people uh, watching today. Um, question here saying that you know there is some publicity and, and uh, about um, the fact that food retailers might be using the cost of living uh, crisis as a smoke screen to sort of hike prices higher than reasonably economically justified. Um, you know. Is, is there any truth in these rumours? Um, is, is there anything? And, and if so, um, you know, what could the industry uh, do to combat that? Um, anyone want to chip in on that? No. No. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I suppose they are. Uh, they are just. Uh, they are just uh, rumours. Um, one particular uh, for Andrew. I mean, um, obviously we buy a lot of our uh, shopping online. Do your figures take account online shopping as well? They do, yeah. So we, <clears throat> within those numbers, and we didn't talk about channels and retailers today, yeah. but we would have a read of, of online grocery purchasing as well. What we've seen with that is that share, not surprisingly, peaked in early 2021 in the, in the last of the big lockdowns as people were sort of, trying to spend as much time at home as possible but it, and it that share has dropped away a little bit but it's still much much higher than it was in 2019 so as per some of those comments i made we've sort of readjusted a bit from where we were in lockdown but we've certainly taken some of those habits with us as well okay thank you um another question i think probably andrew again um you, you mentioned that consumers are being mindful of, of making conscious de decisions as as choices into which categories they trade down in. Um, interesting question. Have you seen any particular behaviour in categories where the purchaser is not the end consumer, so sort of baby care, pet food, um, so where they're, they're buying for somebody else to consume? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to unpick that because I think what we'd say, I think we all look at certain categories in the grocery store and think that's one that I wouldn't compromise on, or that's a brand I wouldn't compromise on. That's something that's really important to me. The difficulty of seeing that in the data is my the categories that are most important to me might be entirely different to, to the three of you or anyone in the audience as well. So it it isn't a it isn't a case of some categories suffer more than others. It's about how many people can you convince that your product is is the thing that you shouldn't sacrifice versus the thing that actually I can make a bit of a saving here because it doesn't really matter whether mm. I buy the the premium product or the cheaper product so it it's difficult to generalize um but um yeah the the job of the marketer i guess is to is to make sure that you're you're on the list of won't sacrifice worse versus, versus will sacrifice yeah um brilliant thank you for that um question for liliana um uh big question uh, how big effect do you think that you know brexit actually had on the um the uk food and drink market and um whether you answer this or not, you know, would we be better or worse if we were still part of the EU? <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. Just an idea uh, of the, the impact I, of Brexit, as opposed to everything else, I suppose. Yeah, well, I don't think we can. 
we can know what's the impact of Brexit yet because we don't have yet all those uh, all those trade deals finalized. So uh, mm. it uh, those impacts are still unfolding as uh, as we speak. Um, also, the fact that uh, that uh, uh, the pandemic happened when it happened makes it more difficult to to really uh, you, know, you know come up with a very robust economic model to. Uh, uh, to unpack those. But there's no question that Brexit has imposed a lot of red tape, which um, which implies higher cost of doing business with, uh, with the EU. And we see a negative impact on that when we look at our exports. So for our members, that has been quite, uh, quite difficult. Also, the industry, as I mentioned, is 97% um, of the industry or 97% of the businesses in the industry are small and mid-sized uh, businesses, which means that they have been impacted disproportionately by Brexit because they don't have the power to, to employ several people in the company to fill out the paperwork that's required to, uh, uh, to deal with, um, with the new, new trading terms. So there's no, no, no question that from an economic impact on uh, on our sector it has not been a, a positive one now that being said i think there's only so much we can uh, dwell on the past and we have to uh, to uh, to think of what can happen in uh, in the future and i think current current trade negoti negotiations are some uh, providing some uh, some um, some hopes mm. yes yes so fingers crossed for that for for those talks um Okay, thank you for that. Um, other question, and I guess it might be for Andrew. Uh, we've got somebody asking about shrinkflation, um, which is obviously manufacturers um, reducing the size of their products but charging the same. Um, do you have any any data on that now, and whether that's happening apart from anecdotal, obviously? Yeah, we're not we're not seeing. I think it's one of those things that gets talked about more than we're seeing it in reality and i think one of the reasons is it's happened a lot in the past to stick to to try and hit specific price points like the the need to be able to sell a product at a pound and people have had to reduce pack sizes to hit those price points the the, the reason it's not easy to carry on doing that is there clearly comes a point when you can't reduce any further the other thing that's happening is the prominence of those headline price points like one pound two pound three pounds one pound fifty is reducing so the proportion of products sold at those kind of price points has dropped dramatically again forced by inflation so people can't hold at a pound anymore so the the volume of that going on is less than it might be perceived to be and certainly less than it has in the past actually if you look at the market in totality the average pack size is going up rather than down because of the mix of things that people are buying mm. yeah it's, it's interesting i also noticed well i noticed you know when i go around lots more retailers are also doing bulk buys so they're doing they seem to be doing larger um you know larger containers and and, and larger packs so people seem to be sort of uh bulk buying more i suppose um question for uh simon um so i mean when when uh you know when you go and see a, a company what are the, what are the sort of the top questions that, that that they ask um before they sort of engage with you yeah, there's some um, there's some kind of nuts and bolts questions along the lines of um, food safety standards and compliance. Um, unsurprisingly, I mean, particularly well for branded businesses and for own label um, um, organisations, they um, they need to make sure that we will do right by their product, and that mm. that will range from us promising not to sell it because they're not going to give it to us if we're just going to sell it somewhere, obviously. Um, through to making sure that we store it, uh, we transport it, and we deliver it correctly, so that mm. that if it's um, I don't know if it's a, like an ASDA uh, ready meal, it's not acceptable if that ready meal turns up having not been appropriately chilled um, or, or stored in the right condition. So it's the it's the basics of, of um, yeah standards and compliance and food safety mm. and handling. Um, and then it's around speed of delivery. So how fast can we turn it around? Often we'll get a, like a you know, day one for day two if it's short shelf life, but that's okay. That still works. Um, 
And then I guess once they're satisfied that we are reputable, trustworthy, um, and that we have national scale, which we do, is we cover the whole of the UK. Um, it's around understanding the impact we have. So, um, because from their point of view, they want to work with us because they want to see that their surplus food is doing good. Yeah. And so we will then um, and demonstrate to that to them. We will feed back to them on a regular basis. So every quarter, every six months, we're able to report back to them to say, you gave us X tons of products and these are the organizations it was sent to. These are the number of people it's benefited. And we're able to demonstrate and feed back on the impact that their food has had. Hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, one, uh, one, well, one for each of you, if you can come for each of you in turn. Um, I suppose with the future gazing and 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 um, it's always always tricky putting people on the spot. But you know, where do you think we'll be in twelve months' time? Um, you know, in terms of the market and and the pressures on producers and the pressures on consumers and and uh, and globally. So it's as, as as big or small as you like. But um, Andrew's first on my screen. So Andrew, where will we be in twelve months' time? I think, as, as Liliana talked about in her presentation, I think we'll see inflation as we measure it being lower, but it's easy to forget when we look at inflation that it, the, what we've already experienced is locked in. So it's not like prices are going to be dropping back to where they were 12 months mm -hmm. ago. They're, they're still higher. They're just not rising as quickly. And therefore, I think we'll see consumers still exhibiting many of the behaviours that I described. And... As per the comment with regard to people sticking with habits that they absorbed during lockdown, if people are adjusting their behaviours a little bit, and I'd emphasise the word a little bit, because prices are rising, I think they'll hold on to some of those behaviours because they find, actually, I can save a bit of money here and it's not really making that much difference to my life, so I'll stick with it. In the same way, they change their behaviour by staying at home a bit more during um, lockdown, and people have decided, in some cases, they quite like that and have stuck with it. So I think I think we'll see less year-on-year -year pressure but a lot of the same behaviors still in place thank you very much uh, liliana well um not to be the the gloom and doom here but as i was mentioning it takes uh, seven to twelve months for uh, for cost rises to to filter through so in terms of in terms of the consumer side the, um, um, uh, the retail inflation Again, as I was mentioning, we think in food that will continue till mid-year and then inflation will start coming down. But to get a bit geeky, we'll start coming down just because we are comparing high prices with higher prices. So we have a higher comparable base. It's not necessarily because prices in themselves would have gone down. Uh, also, if we look at former um, um, uh, crisis when uh, prices had uh, for food had increased significantly in 2008, 2011, or 2014. Uh, when the the crisis would have passed, prices start coming down, but they never reach the previous level. And I think the most intuitive explanation for that is that if wages are flowing up. Once prices come down, wages will not really go down. So at least the impact of wages will be uh, will be locked in uh, into prices. So it's it's difficult to really expect same uh, same level of prices that we had as before the the pandemic. So that's for uh, that's on the um, that on the household side. On the production side, um, again some pressures have started easing, which are uh, very positive news but they are not easing fast enough and not really across the board as, uh, as cost rises have been across the board. So for um, you know, the next year, if, I, if only I had a crystal ball, I think it will be quite, uh, quite challenging for, uh, for um, our members to, uh, um, to continue to deal with a very tough, um, very tough environment. And again, it's really at the point where they have to make really difficult decision to where they have to cut other other expenses within the company to be able to um, to absorb some of the cost rises and the danger is that we'll have too much investment cut for uh, you know when it comes to uh, to the future so that may not be over the the next 24 months but there is a danger that 
the pressures right now are so overwhelming that it might less have a, a lasting impact on the long-term uh, growth of, uh, of the industry. Uh, but that being said, I still think that our, uh, our members are quite, um, quite innovative and resilient, whereas again, as we have seen, right, even, even during the pandemic, um, we had those, uh, those few weeks of panics where shelves were not really um, filled because people were panicking so much, but once they have seen that actually food still, uh, still comes to, uh, to the shops, everybody calm down. So, so I have faith in, uh, in the resilience of, uh, of our members, I guess. Brilliant. So, so not out of the woods yet, light at the end of the tunnel, um, keep going. <laughs> um, yeah. Simon, get, getting your crystal ball out, um, you know, 12 months time, what, what, what do you think in the picture is going to be for, for fair share and, 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 and the people that you're helping and the retailers that you're, that you're working with? Yeah, I, I echo the comments that we've heard from, from the other two speakers that um, yeah. I don't expect anything to change um, soon. Um, the level of demand for the food that we distribute far outstrips the supply that we can access. And I'm not seeing that that's going to be changing anytime soon. So I think in 12 months time, we're going to be doing you know, the same um, and having as big an impact as we possibly can. Um, working with you know, the organizations that support us with their food or their money um, to maximize the impact that we can have. But no, I don't see, I don't see the food, level of food insecurity. Hopefully it'll level up. If it can decline, that would be amazing. At the moment, it continues to increase. Mm, yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, I see it's five to three. Um, so um, I think we're gonna have to wrap it up. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, again our panel, Andrew, Liliana and Simon uh, for giving us their insight today. I mean, it's been incredible uh, two hours. Um, you know, I think I would recommend that once the once video is up, that everybody goes and, and watches it again because there's so much, uh, so much great insight, insight there. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the CIM FDA committee for helping organising this event. Um, do please go and join our LinkedIn group. Um, we've got over a thousand members um, and there's some discussion goes on there or you can post something that you find interesting. Um, if you go onto LinkedIn and just search CIM FDA, uh, you'll find us there. Finally, of course, we'll be sending out a short survey. Uh, we're all marketers, so we all know how important feedback is. Um, so the survey will go out uh, later today. So do let us know um, what you've thought of today. Um, and just as importantly, you know, anything you'd like us to cover in the future. Um, you know, we, 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 we like to do these events and we like to provide you with, uh, with value and insight from great industry speakers. Um, so if there's anything in particular, do let us know uh, and we'll have a look at it. Um, so it just leaves me to say, you know, thank you once again to the speakers. Thank you all for joining us again today. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Um, take care, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.